getting things set so that we can actually record and or also be um, virtual at the same time with Zoom, but we have not got all of that worked out yet. But we are recording this meeting for the neighbors who are not able to come so that we'll be able to share it with them. Um, the ECC does have some ground rules for our meetings. Um, we, the number one is that we have respect and civility. We care about everyone, our neighbors, our neighborhood, our city, and all the presenters. Number two, we stand by our core values and also negotiate win-win whenever possible. Number three, everyone has the right to be understood and to be heard. We will take the time it needs for people to have that opportunity to speak and do. We also consider all viewpoints. Number four, we can disagree without being disagreeable. And number five, become involved in the committee where you feel most passionate so that you can contribute and be part of the team. There's room for everyone. And we have um, one announcement as chair that I'd like to make is we were, we have been um, looking for a neighborhood representative for the Benyon neighborhood. And we have not been able to identify someone who is willing to step forward. We have a lot of neighbors in the Benyon area who are very involved and interested, but not able to be the representative and we felt like there needed to be a board member that represents them and so melinda main and i'll let you stand up melinda or wave okay will be representing both the bryant and the benyon neighborhood until we have someone who has come forward so if you're in the benyon neighborhood or know anyone that you know think might be interested we would love to have them participate okay so Number one, we, the thing that we put on Facebook, which is right now our main communication vehicle, and I know many folks don't love Facebook, so we also have our email. We want to make sure that you're on our main email distribution. What we find in these meetings is that often people sign up on the sign-up sheet, but we can't read the email, um, it, or there's something off, and so it rejects. So if you aren't getting emails and you've signed up before, please make sure that we have your correct email so that we can distribute to you. We as a neighborhood and the University of Utah have grown up together for over 122 years. Um, the neighborhood area got opened for development after Central City was opened and People started being able to buy lots up in the area. A lot of it was pasture and farm area. It was on the hill, so it was difficult for a lot of folks to be up near the, where the U is now. And as you know, the University of Utah was actually downtown, and they relocated to our area. And so over 122 years ago, we have now been side by side as a neighborhood with the University of Utah. We, over the years, had extensive relationships with a great deal of the leadership at the University of Utah, not only because we had forged that over time, but also because a large majority of our area actually is students, faculty, and staff that moved into the area so that they could be closer to their employment or to where they study. And so um, as we've worked together, we had these extensive relationships, and what I keep saying is they've all deserted us because they decided to retire, or a few of them left for promotions and other things. So we are in the process of wanting to reestablish a strong relationship so that we can work out the things that we all need, whether it be the neighborhood, whether it be the U, whether it be our business district. And that is how we do things in the ECC. We work collaboratively. We work win-win as much as possible. It's not that we don't have broomsticks in the closet when we need them, but luckily we haven't had to use those for many a year, which is very nice, and that's how we'd like to keep it. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to start. We wanted to bring a few folks from the U who actually represent things that we as a community can participate with. So first I'd like to introduce Jane to come up from Redview Gardens. Thank 
you. I'm the Marketing Communications Director at Red Butte Gardens, and if you're a member of Red Butte Gardens, thank you for your support. And if you're not, I invite you to come up and see all the things that there is to do up there. We like to say, say that we have 100 acres of therapy up there, and we have something for everyone. So let me tell you a, a, a few things that we've got going this summer. We started our concert series. We've had the first two concerts, and the next one is June 14th, and we'll run concerts through September 20th. We still have tickets available for nine shows, and, we're, and also we're having the Ballet West perform in the garden um, in September. And that last year was the first time we had Ballet West do an outdoor ballet for us, and it was wildly popular. It's a nice way to take the family um, out and be able to bring the picnic, sit out on the lawn, and see something totally different. So I would encourage you to look on our website under events, and all of these programs are listed. We also do films in the garden. Those are free um, for Sundance Institute films that will be, uh, we have two films in July. And once again, you can bring your picnic and the blanket and just spread out under the stars and watch a movie, and it's great fun. And then we have Teton Gravity Research is going to um, have a film that kind of caters to mountain bikers. So that's going to be in the middle of June. That's going to be something kind of different. And we're reaching out to all the high schools because mountain biking is a club sport. So we're hoping to see a lot of young people up there. We also have art events in the garden. And right now we have Stephanie St. Thomas. She does mixed media paintings, and that's in our guest services center. And there's no charge to shop when you come to uh, look at the arts. Exhibits. And then in July, we'll start with, we always have the Utah Watercolor Society bring in an art exhibit, and that's always very, very popular too. So you'll see a lot of local artists from around the valley and Berkeley. And then we're resuming our, now that we are back in the garden, thank goodness, and we don't have to do everything virtually, we're resuming our concert, I mean, our, excuse me, our lecture series. And we'll have Tom Freed from Memorial Botanic Gardens in Kew, England, come and talk about the boldest collections of the Royal Botanical Garden. And so a lot of people are really excited about that. The one nice thing about Red Butte right now, everybody is planning to do something more than sit at home after the last two years. And so all those spaces have been very popular. Our membership numbers are the highest they've ever been um, since we reopened. And our visitation is uh, set to set new records because the garden is open and it's a place where people feel relatively safe and so you're able to come and again bring a picnic and spend some time in the garden there are little um, waysides where you can separate yourself from the loud um, summer camps that are filling the garden right now or you can just um, scope out a venue we have uh, indoor and outdoor venues for family celebration corporate events and weddings and we've done a lot of celebrations of life of life and weddings in the last couple of weeks so People are just really anxious to get out and spend time outdoors, and so I think that's what one of our core competencies is, and our secret discriminator. Um, so if you haven't been there, I would invite you to come up and see all the blooms. Right now we've got the wisterias out, that's always a popular um, attraction, and pretty soon the roses will start blooming. And the most important thing, now that we're all trying to be water-wise, we have a three-acre water conservation garden, and we've planted hydrozones so that you can see collections of like, like plants grouped together. And hydrozone is when you collect plants and plant, you do your plantings so that there are the same water needs. And so you'll be able to, you can see, get some great ideas for your own gardens and how to group your strip. And um, I think it's important one thing we like to tell people. Xeriscaping doesn't just need to be cactus and rocks. So if you come up to the garden, you'll see the kinds of flowers that you can have women in the water garden, and it's a good resource. So uh, I invite you to take advantage of it. Thank you. With the effort that we all have with our um, care of our water, and we also need to remember our trees, even if we are taking things off our park strips, um, that we still water the trees at least once a week. And I think we had a wonderful presentation last meeting about how to actually take care of the trees and how much water they need right at their trunk for during drought time. So we will get that posted so that we can have both of those. 
Um, one of the things that many people don't know is that Helen Wells, uh, who was a resident of the area for over 67 years, was the main tree commissioner of um, Salt Lake City way before um, there was a forestry department. And she and Dick Kilbreth and others helped actually secure the land for Red Butte and for many other areas um, around the city that are now our parks. So we had a very strong um, women's committee that used to meet on our porch <laughs> that would sit and support these kind of causes. That's another example of how over time we have worked together win-win. All right, so next I had a TBA and it's Catherine, is that right? No? Diane. Diane, okay. Diane, come on up for Pioneer Theater. Hi, good evening. Thank you very much for inviting Pioneer Theater Company to come and speak uh, to you this evening. Uh, my name is Diane Parisi. I am Pioneer Theater Company's Interim Managing Director, and I'm also serving as their Director of Development. Um, uh, Pioneer Theater Company is a professional theater in residence at the University of Utah and we are housed in the Simmons Pioneer Memorial Theater, which sits at uh, um, 13th East and 300 South, facing downtown to where Broadway is on 300 South downtown. So uh, um, I'm, uh, the, we, the building was built in 1962, and the theater became professionalized in 1984. And we serve the public uh, by providing uh, professional theater productions built from scratch seven a year during the academic year between September and May every year. And uh, what people don't seem to understand sometimes about Pioneer Theater Company is that we are not um, a university theater though we do utilize the resources that are available to us from the Department of Theater. We have many, many of our productions, uh, the uh, students there are, um, are cast in our shows and receive professional experience, experience they would not be able to get anywhere else except if they went to the major theater cities like New York and Chicago and LA. And we're very proud of our programs with them, our internship programs with them. Um, we uh, hire professional theater, uh, actors, designers, and directors to come to Salt Lake City uh, to uh, create the productions that we offer. Um, and those span the breadth of uh, the theater genre. Each season we produce musicals, sometimes new musicals, as we will be doing next season. Uh, contemporary pieces, classical pieces, all in one season. So there's something for everyone uh, in our season. Although we encourage you to look into purchasing a, a, a season package so that uh, you can see what the breadth of theater is in our community. Um, we have suffered a bit, unlike the gardens, uh, because we are an indoor venue. Uh, we suffered a little bit during COVID uh, we were a shuttered venue for 18 months, and this season marks mark our reopening um, after COVID. And after COVID is a misnomer because we're still we're still in it. Um, and um, the rules and regulations that we had to follow in order to bring professional actors and designers and directors to the theater were were. Um, pricey, but we felt that we were ready to serve the community again and um, have, uh, are proud to say, unlike our colleagues and other sister arts organizations, that we did not have one incident of uh, COVID infection that stopped a production or postponed a production. We, um, uh, that was uh, truly a challenge and uh, we kept everyone safe and uh, hopefully we kept our audience entertained as well. Um, 
If you've not attended a, a theater production, I, I, I recommend that you do so. Again, like I said, we have a wide variety of, um, of productions, uh, uh, different types. If you like, if you're a musical lover, we've got that for you. And, ex and next year, for example, we are actually having four musicals. And let me just tell you what we're, we'll be doing. I'm very excited about our first musical. It is a production that is um, scheduled to go farther on. You know, I, I, I can't be really specific about that, but it's like an opening uh, out-of-town tryout. And the name of the musical is Shucked. It's a charming musical about middle America uh, and a town that um, uh, is all about its corn, and hence the title Shucked. Uh, we're going to be doing a new ad adaptation of Moliere's Scapan, which you might find interesting if you like the classics. Uh, for Christmas, we're doing A Christmas Story, the musical, um, and our December shows always tend to bring in uh, uh, family groups, and uh, they're always just uh, wonderful events for families. Uh, we're doing a world premiere called A, Dis a Distinct Society, which is really poignant and thoughtful play about a library which truly exists that sits on the border of the United States and Canada and how people who have been kept away due, due to the Muslim ban meet together uh, and reunite inside the library because it sits on the border. Uh, we're doing a musical tribute to Stephen Sondheim who had recently passed away called Putting It Together and um, we will be uh, closing our season with The Prom. It's a new musical that has gotten, that had got uh, many Tony Awards uh, uh, in recent years. And one other wonderful thing is that we, with the Department of Theater, are um, excited about a new theater that we are building inside the Einer Nielsen Fieldhouse. We have saved that building from well, I don't know what we saved it from, but we are giving it new life. Uh, the Department of Theater and Pioneer Theater Company jointly got together and raised money to build a 380-seat uh, theater, small theater, thrust theater in that space. And uh, some, a small space is something that we've always wanted for our more intimate pieces, our, our more intimate new plays. And the theater department desperately needed a, a stage because currently they only have black box, a black box theater. So that is an exciting um, uh, project. And we will be doing our first production there in, um, let's see, I think that is in April of 2023. And we hope you all come and see this new space as we open it. Thank you. Thank you, that's a very nice um, save of a historic building, that's awesome. Um, next we have, um, our speaker was uh, contracted COVID, so we're gonna fill in with our favorite city council person. I just can't spot her. Ava, where are you? I mean, that's uh, Ava, Anna, where are you? Oh, there you are, okay. Thank you for those words. Um, uh, Today, I may have not been the most popular council member at council um, after talking about budget. So, um, my name is Ana Valdemoros. I represent District 4. Um, we are uh, towards the end of the budget season. I have not heard from a lot of you, and I need you guys to um, tell me if you, uh, you know, if you're uh, like happy with what the mayor is proposing. Um, and the next vote, the final vote, will be next Tuesday. So there will be some tax increases, property tax increase, um, some increases for the library, some increases for governmental immunity. So yeah, your 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 bill, your property um, tax will come a little bit higher. It's not as as high as it could be, but um, but it is higher. So I need your comments back. I am right now at this moment probably the only council member that is not super happy about raising taxes, especially with um, new growth money that we received, especially with ARPA funding that we've got 
to do one-time projects and um, and also uh, when we don't look really at what's working and what's not working. So that's my train of thought in budget. However, there's a lot of good things that will happen with a new budget um, that you may all agree on. And if that's what the community wants, I'm happy to vote for it. But uh, knowing that I'm a little iffy about the budget. Uh, some of the good things that are happening with the new budget is last year we did create public lands, like as a, as a, um, it used to be like a division and now it's actually a department. So it's bigger, so we have more staff to do more things. And one of the cool things about it is that we will have uh, park rangers. So instead of having uh, a lot of police presence or trying to call police to come tend to something, we'll have constant people at the park looking um, into the park and the hopefully the you know the bad act, that will deter some bad activities that may be happening. Um, we will have additional funds for um, um, to for maintenance of the park and for improvements in different parts in the city and a lot uh, the mayor wants to put a lot of money at Pioneer Park which I agree and we need. Um, we will have um, in terms of policing and safety, we will have a, it's called an alternative response model, where um, instead of having to call the police because somebody is having a mental health issue and being disruptive in our streets, but is not committing the crime, then we may be able to respond with medical attention or a social worker or trying to deter this person from being harmed to themselves or to somebody else and get them into services. So we, these are pilot programs and with, with these new increases that hopefully it will work and will we'll, um, uh, free up some of the police department um, officers to go tend to something that is not criminal. They should be actually taking care of, of criminals and not somebody that obviously it's mentally ill. As you can see in District 4, that's where the city gets the most calls and where you can see people suffering in the streets. And I, and I understand that it's, for a lot of us, it's, um, it's hard to see, but it's also, we, we usually focus on, well, this person is um, a criminal, so they should be taken to jail. But if you if you really look into it, this person, this, most people that are walking around downtown or in this area are having episodes and on top of being mentally ill, they might be using drugs and so that's a combination um, that it's lethal really and it's scary for all of us and to, to themselves. So those are the things that the council has been looking at this year. Um, again, um, I love these proposals that the mayor has amongst a lot of other things, but it's just a little hard sometimes we don't look what we have right now, is it working? Where are the deficiencies? And see if we can free up some money instead of raising taxes and fees. So that's that's that for you. Um, uh, a lot of things are happening in, in District 4 in terms of development. I know, um, you, especially this neighborhood, it's, you know, we're very, like, uh, we're a garden, making sure that, that um, not a, you know, not a lot of density or super, like, high buildings or tall buildings are happening and I think that's still my train of thought uh, when we have a lot of rezone discussions. There's one that didn't happen uh, in this district, uh, the, I'm sure you're aware, the Western Garden, Western Gardens, that it's next to Jordan Square. The vote was yesterday and I, we received a lot of um, comments, people that were very unhappy about that um, rezone, which would be a, a form-based zone um, for housing. But uh, and the two main reasons why people are a little unhappy is one is a historic district, two, um, there's going to be more housing and so the parking is always an issue and then it might be too close to other single family homes that are right there. And so um, we were able to work with a development agreement where the, the, the developer agreed to do some more, more parking because he had zero parking required. So we added parking and we added setbacks so it's not as close um, but I still I know there's some people still unhappy about that um, I do feel like the FD zoning district even though it's not the best with the amount of high density housing that we're being you know asked to to uh, to do in district 4 this is probably the most appropriate zone in that area so um, I'm sorry if, if I was disappointed for, for, for some of you but that's my that's my um, my reasoning for that. We need the housing. Uh, we need affordable housing, but 
that doesn't this project doesn't accomplish that, but it does accomplish housing, and and it's not a lot of housing. It's just a couple of houses um, that we've done, and so um, I feel kind of okay with that. And what else? Um, the summer is coming. Um, things are still happening, as you know. Farmers market is going on. Um, we do not have right now, in terms of public safety, we don't have a designated police officer, unfortunately. Detective Meisner, which is listed in, in your program, he was promoted. So um, we will be sans a, a specific police officer for a couple of weeks until they designate one. Um, in terms of business, so the mayor has uh, decided that there will be one police officer designated to take care of the uh, the business needs uh, in terms of safety. So, um, and I will give you that information to you, Esther. Um, his name is Andrew. So, if you have a business and there's something going on outside that needs police attention, we have um, a designated police officer for businesses, so we can uh, call them directly. So, hopefully, that works as well. It, it kind of he will make that determination. Do we need ten patrol? You know, patrol cars, or can we call uh, medical assistance or um, somebody to clean up? And there's also a new um, rapid intervention team that will come over and clean up the bio waste that maybe may, somebody may have left um, in front of your home or in front of your of, of your business. So um, stay tuned. As, as soon as I have that number, I will give it to you as well. But I'm sure Andrew. Officer Andrew will, will have it. Um, there's so many things I want to say, uh, it's keeping my mind. So, um, oh, and then ultimately, I did have cafecito with Anna last Saturday. We used to do that pre pandemic where I would go to a coffee shop and invite any any uh, members of the public that wanted to come over and have breakfast and just talk about anything really seated related. So, we did that on, on Saturday at Caputo's. We will do that again in the next couple of months so that we can meet again just very informally um, just to catch up and see what the needs are and the you know the remaining issues in the community and I know um, Jen Colby came over and I offered some of the signs that said kids and uh, and pets uh, you know slow down kids and pets live here she wasn't super happy about it but I have a lot of them she doesn't think those are effective but we think uh, I still think the majority of people will be Look more cautious. So I have a lot of them. Please uh, let me know if you want some. I can drop them off or staff will drop them off. So you, you know where to contact me. This is my information. I have a bunch of emails. I want you to go turn those signs for your lawn. So budget, please let me know if you are happy. Um, if I don't hear from anybody, I'm assuming that people are okay with, with the budget and, and the bonds and, and the increases. Um, if I, you know, if I, uh, so I will go reluctantly yes but if there's a lot of um uh what you call it people that aren't happy with it i i think i will vote no because i'm still not 100 percent sure that, that this is the, the route that we need to take take so thank you thank you so much Esther. Thank you. in the 25 years i've now been working in the community um I have to say that Anna is my favorite city council person. And the reason is that she actually sits down and talks with us and works win-win. We have the benefit of her being a planner in Salt Lake City when I first met her. So she has that background and experience. And because our zoning is so patchwork, we have so many different zones right next to each other. Um, but even though developers can develop in the zones as is, they always want to come and tear down more houses and make bigger structures. And what's really nice is that Anna listens to us and looks about the exceptions and whether it actually makes sense, and she she helps us. And that's it's one of the first in the four or five city council people I've worked with who ever actually listened and actually did what the community asked for. So I really appreciate her. And uh, we are, as you know, redistricting happened and part of uh, district for went away. Anna's got one of the biggest jobs because it, it covers all of downtown, all the way it was from the freeway all the way up to the U. And now it's shrunk from the um, to the business district downtown, but she's kept us. So and we continue this next year with Anna as well. Um, 
So now I am very pleased to bring up our next speaker, which is Chase Haygood from the University of Utah. When many of us heard the new president's talks about um, expansion and being less of a commuter campus and growing to 40,000 students, which plus the staff and the faculty that supports that, it kind of sent shockwaves through, but not more shockwaves than we had when we first started dealing with uh, one Chicago developer that was interested in taking down what we've always called University Row, Professor Row, plus um, the old institute building. And there were many people who worked on that project, and of course we aren't there yet, but uh, we still, as a community, very much hope that we can continue to work collaboratively and come up with solutions that do not negatively impact our neighborhood and yet support the U. In fact, how many people went to the U? Right here. <laughs> there you go. And uh, not only did a lot of us go to the U, but the U helped raise my kids in summer camps and preschool and on and on. And. Uh, uh, jobs um, that my children have had, so many of us have, have been very strongly involved and we want to keep having this positive relationship. So we're excited to hear the 10-year growth plan and it'll give us ideas. There are a lot of smart people in the community that can help come up with creative ideas as well. So please come forward. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Chair Hunter, very, very much. And thank you all. Uh, thanks to colleagues from the U who are here who presented already and will join in a panel uh, momentarily and will present more ideas uh, momentarily. As Chair Hunter mentioned uh, in my introduction, my name is Chase Haygood, and I'm the Senior Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs and the Dean of Undergraduate Studies at the University of Utah. But let me start by saying I think that these kinds of dialogues are really what make university and community partnerships happen. And so on behalf of President Randall, Interim um, Provost Martel Teasley, and the university as a whole, we're delighted to be here and thank you for the invitation. I joined the University of Utah almost one year ago in July of 2021. I arrived in Utah, as you may detect from my accent, from uh, further east and south from the University of Georgia, where I served as the director of the Division of Academic Enhancement. When I was at the University of Georgia, I led services and programs, initiatives and curriculum, many of which touched on our local community that were designed to enhance the student experience. As a first-generation college graduate and a trained academic historian, I am deeply committed to seeing higher education work for all students. In fact, Students First sits at the heart of my leadership philosophy, and as the new SAVPAA and Dean, it's my priority to ensure that the student experience across the U, all of those experiences, are accessible, challenging, and transformative. It is a privilege and, again, an honor to engage in that work with so many talented and passionate individuals at the University of Utah, some of whom you've heard from already, and some you'll hear from in a moment. From admission to graduation, the units of undergraduate studies at the university provide every student with an exceptional educational experience that empowers them to lead transformational lives wherever their educational and professional futures might take them. The Office of Undergraduate Studies encompasses a wide range of units, working in partnership with many of the colleges, all the colleges, the schools, and many units. We work from general education to student success, transformative experiences, to student access and community engagement, to faculty success and academic innovation. The vision of President Taylor Randall is for the University of Utah to become a top 10 public university unsurpassed in its societal impact over the next 10 years. We can accomplish this by prioritizing three goals Number one, inspiring student success by revolutionizing the student experience and achieve outstanding student outcomes. Number two, improve lives through innovation and generation of research discoveries. And three, by impacting the lives of all Utahns through engaging communities. At the U, 
we make an impact on our students and community by assisting students in applying the knowledge, skills, and experiences they gain at the university to solving local, national, and global challenges. We are investing in programming that prepares students to be powerful global citizens as well as community leaders. Student experience and their success motivates all that we do. Over the next decade, we will reimagine what an education at the University of Utah looks like. In his inaugural address, President Randall said, and I quote, we need to think of our campus as more than a classroom, more like an experience, a playground, where absolutely anything can be possible. And this begins literally by building a campus that integrates learning, living, and the world around us, end quote. We are focused on expanding the student body, as was mentioned, to 40,000 students and building a campus that integrates learning, living, and community. We want to create a university town where students have the exciting opportunity to live and learn, where students are able to be active participants in their learning. This reimagining won't just be about buildings or physical spaces. We are shifting focus to directly integrate students into research and knowledge creation as soon as they enter the university. We are breaking new ground by developing 1YU, a first year experience program, as well as the Utah experience where students will participate in experiential learning opportunities, including undergraduate research, learning abroad, internships, and community engaged learning. The goal is to have every first and second year student engaged in experiential learning at the U. Learning communities and living learning communities play a key and vital role in offering students the chance to interact with peers who have similar interests. Through learning communities, we ensure that students engage with transformational work, gain valuable experience, and then use those experiences to change the world around them. And we do this based on evidence-based approaches. We know, in fact, that there is a strong market demand for living learning communities. We know, according to 40 plus years of educational research, that on-campus living increases student persistence and improves graduation rates. And we are engaged in strategic planning to utilize the campus year-round and engage undergraduates in experiential as well as living learning opportunities. With an education from the University of Utah, students will have the ability to imagine, to dream, and to do something extraordinary. With that, again, I say thank you. Thank you to the uh, community. And I think we'll welcome questions perhaps with people. That's right. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all very, very much. Can I invite the panel members forward, please? And did we say we had one more mic? I can't see where it is. Five minutes or five minutes?